Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackEnt, and this is the March 2nd DevOps Lunch and Learn, where we talked about uh, be, doing unit tests against pipelines, something you, you don't think about very much. But if you're building a CI pipeline, or for RackEnt, we talk about this from an automation pipeline, how do you test that that pipeline is right as you make changes to it? Um, how do you know that an improvement to that process doesn't break or make unreproducible other builds and things like that. So we really spent some time talking about this very important development operations support problem in ways I think you'll find very interesting. If you hadn't thought about this before, listen closely, you'll learn something. And if this is an interesting problem to you, come back. Uh, we'll probably want to talk about it some more. It's a real problem for organizations across the planet. The hack they just found in all of the Apple uh, software including uh, the the new architecture and it's in the operating system so Ooh, what that one i hadn't heard about i think it's in the op it's in the operating system or uh, utilities yeah and it's it's compiled in it hides and it's designed to to uh remove itself if discovered they found it in at least thirty thousand Macs. Are you talking about the one targeting uh, the, the M1 architecture, or, or is it? It actually different? does both, and but it's it's uh, na they did a native M1 version of it, so it's native for either of the two, and it hasn't called home yet, so they're not exactly sure what it's intended to do. It's just hanging out there. Uh, yeah, I, I I didn't know that that it that it wasn't active. Uh, I when I when I read about it, uh, the interesting part was uh, how it how it avoided detection. Yes, and they they have not they they have not seen it activated. It's just been dormant so far as they've been able to tell. And, Rick, and I think Rob is looking for it. I'll go see if I can find it too. See if you, yeah, that'd be cool. I guess I, vulnerability, I mean, I keep going in circles, right? Vulnerabilities are the norm is there and they're, they're increasingly sophisticated. There's no panacea short of not having software. By the way, I just posted a link to the uh, Ars Technica article in chat. Oh, good. Thank you. You found it for us. Thank you. Yep, that's the one that I was reading. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, the persistent malware is. Uh, it's definitely uh, it's not new, but but uh, there there has been an, an increase in, in in sightings. But yeah, I and the the one that was that we started on with the supply chain vulnerability. I'm I, I was trying to figure out. Because I was reading that, and it sounded like they were dependent on people thinking that they're using a, a trusted library from a vendor like Amazon and or Zappos, and then, um, but it's not. That is a, a that's a frequent one, and in, in particular with with programming yeah. languages, yeah. Um, the it, NPM has seen several of those where. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're basically imposter libraries, which, which have the behavior of the of the library that they're uh, impersonating, plus right. the malicious payload. And, and in many cases, that's, that's typically a crypto miner, but uh, it, it can be used for more nefarious purposes, for sure. Yeah, the, the key is tricking the the software. Uh, the the build process to go in, go out 
to the the web to get the library instead of using the one that's local. Yeah. yeah, and some of these things you could be a sent like they're when I saw some people who were doing email phishing and um, this was actually a reply all thread. They they've talked about this type of security before, but they they did they they the person who was doing some some uh, white hat work um, to s test them like got a domain that was they had an M in their domain name I think media and they got RN same domain name mm -hmm. but with an RN in it so it looked like just like an M t typographically mm -hmm. and started sending emails looking like it was from their internal people uh, which yeah. is right it's the same it's a similar concept it's uh, you think you're on a trusted source and it's super easy to fake all that stuff out, right? Yeah, and that in particular defeats uh, SPF protections because yeah. you, you don't have to spoof the, uh, the domain name. You, you just continue using yours. Um, yeah. And then you can get it signed and it looks legit and everything's your know, person really, oh yeah, this is the, you know, American media company and I'm all good. Yeah. Uh, an, another common approach, which is much cheaper uh, for the attacker, is simply to, to just use uh, hyperlinks uh, with, the, with the link text being one uh, URL uh, and, and, and the address being a different one. Um, th those, are, those kind of attacks are, are still well, well and alive. Oh, yeah. Um, Unicode as well. Um, um, mm. What else? Like domains with, uh, or like uh, uh, addresses that, that have the, the 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 target domain uh, as a parameter, as a URL parameter. Um, that as well. Um, the layman gets confused by that. Oh yes. And then yeah, uh, just, I so guess the, the solar winds thing where. Uh... <laughs> An intern is the one who set the Solar Winds password to Solar Winds one two three. <laughs> to, to be fair, and uh, like, that, that, that's a failure on, on the Solar Winds side. Exactly. Not the intern, like I mean, the, the, the intern is the no scapegoat. No code review. <laughs> the, it's, it's the intern is the scapegoat. Intern oh. is in quotes here, right? Yeah. Unnamed anonymous intern set the freaking Solar Winds password. Sure. Yeah, yeah it, we it, believe it. It, 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 there's a, if, if it actually happened, it's a complete process failure yep. because an intern should not have been able to set that password in the first place. Exactly. Well, actually, the intern could have been able to set it, but not without a uh, review. Yep. Um, those are sorts that, of things that, that even, even the seniors that should be reviewed with. That's, that's the point. If, if, yeah. if using that as an excuse, well, that's a bigger freaking failure, right? Yeah, exactly. If if they're blaming the intern, that's a big <laughs> failure. <laughs> yeah. yeah the... So what did they? What did? What was? What was that password set on? Was their basic repo? I, I still I still am not. I mean, I understand the basics of that hack, but the the actual door that was left open was does the. Has anybody been tracking it closely enough? That was the default password for the application. Oh. It was uh, the password to the build server. So on the oh, okay. back, you were able oh. to push in code into the build server. So there were, there were a few things that were wrong. A, a kind of a you know stateful, static build server accessible through the outside yeah. with a weak password. I mean, there are like 50 things wrong with that, right? So if you're going to blame an intern for a password, dude, you have a publicly accessible build server. <laughs> so in, in everything else, if in the CI CD pipeline is ephemeral, the build server should be part of that, right? It should not exist. Even though if you look at what the Microsoft analysis was, mm. it was around 100 milliseconds in which uh, the offender was able to come in 
put in the nefarious package and get out. So, you know, there are degrees of ephemeralness, I suppose. <laughs> uh, like how short-lived wow. do you want it to be? So, so of course, right? You have to secure the entire build pipeline. Uh, but there were, there were lots and lots of things wrong with it. Um, the build server had been there for about four months or so with a weak password. It was pointed out in a news group. They still didn't fix it. Um, uh -huh. In fact, SolarWinds was going around and telling their partners, I mean, this happened with CrowdStrike, et cetera. They were telling their partners that if you already have this existing, this is essentially whitelist this because your alerts are going to kind of pick up on this. So they were, yeah. they, were, they were telling people to go around Instead it. Instead of just changing the password? No, no password, uh, not just the password, right? Where you actually start looking at the binaries themselves. Uh, they were telling EDR vendors, of course, you know, the, the good <laughs> one, CrowdStrike included, they said, you're an idiot. <laughs> no, we're not going to do this. <laughs> oh, man. No, there were 50 things wrong with this. Right? Oh. Yeah, and we all need to learn from it because it's so easy to make. make so I will tell mistakes. you, the, the bit that I learned from that is, you know, we could be kind of sort of okay by saying, ah, you know, the build server, it's a part, you know, it's on demand, you build it up, you tear it down. But just in the last month or so, I figured out that, hey, this, like, how, how short-lived does the build server need to be? I mean, if you're really talking about, could it have been prevented? Um, well, you know, earlier on, they'd done some surveillance back in September, right? So they didn't really go in on the attack until Feb. But um, Feb, when they came in, uh, was under 100 milliseconds, in and out. <laughs> but I, I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea of ephemeral build servers. I mean, I could, I could see it. You don't have to have a build server running. You could do it on a per commit basis. Exactly. Um, but I, I'm assuming you're talking about ephemeral like uh, worker nodes for 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 your pipeline. Exactly. That's, Thank yeah. you for the clarification. Okay. So yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, because OpenStack does that. different. Yeah, yeah, and, and Jenkins even let, lets you do that uh, mm -hmm. with Kubernetes. If I could start a container, run, yeah, exactly. run your build, and, and just destroys it. Um, right. All right. That's a build. That's to me an ephemeral build environment, not a. And build the, the not the builds. I, I think of the build server as the the pipeline manager. You're right. not talking about being a but, but the real build server better not have external access. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't. There's no reason you should be able to touch that 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 server during the process. Nope. Interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, it, actually, it, static build servers are bad in general because they pick up dependencies that you don't you, you're not aware of. So it's it's bad practice. Mm. The, Either the, way, there, the, the, there, there's pros and cons. Um, I, I mean, uh, an, an advantage uh, for, for static ones is, is that the, like, if all you care about is, is lead time, you can just cache mm -hmm. everything. Um, and and, yeah. and it, again, it largely depends on, on on what you're building. Like if if you're building a like a microservice system. Yeah, you can go ephemeral because you, your build takes just a couple of seconds. If you're, if you're building a like Linux kernel, well, unless you have a thread ripper, you, you're looking at the 50 minutes to half an hour build time. Right, that's right. Yeah. Plus collecting uh, all the dependencies, that's right. Well, the other thing about this, Rob, is that for companies with large legacy co code bases, most of those companies are probably somewhere in the midst of converting their legacy build systems to something that's more modern. But there's still yeah. enough legacy out there, especially folks that, as Klaus pointed out, that, that do uh, kernels, operating systems, and um, and actually, firmware is a, a big one. Anyone who's no. doing firmware tends oh, gosh, to be yeah. older. No, pretty much anything that's like a monolithic um, artifact that, that you're producing. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think through, uh, like, for, like, we'll have a Jenkins system that builds tons of components. Um, and those are 
you know, containerized or ephemeral from that perspective. Um, and then do a system test, which we're starting to ramp up. That, but that's different. Um, so, it's not a build. It's not a build server. You're yeah, pulling things down. You're running a test. A test suite. Yeah. Consider companies different. like IBM and VMware and HP that have just tons of legacy mm -hmm. software. And some of that stuff, it's not worth touching the system. You just. I, I, make sure that no, I, I, I remember when when an automated build was a was a huge it was like groundbreaking <laughs> right I, early part of my career you know man you know you would have a manual build and and you know worst cases it would come off somebody's desk and they they'd build it and then hand it off to the release people yeah. um, right <laughs> I, I mean that's it. well I didn't work at any company that did things small enough that way for that to happen. <laughs> I, I started life in the uh, military defense quadrant, so that didn't happen even back then. Uh, okay. Military is space and defense, and space, you couldn't do that either because you needed to know what you were building because once it was up there, you couldn't get your hands on it. <laughs> That was, but I mean, it was even source code control was, was a, you know, 20 years ago was, was not that common, right? Yeah. So it's source safe and what a mess that was and CVS. Uh, that was on the small systems on the large systems. There was hand rolled uh, source control. They, they had something. Yeah. And SCCS is actually pretty freaking old. And RCS, uh, yeah, the follow-on. Yeah, no, I was, I was, I grew up. I was a Microsoft baby from that perspective. I grew up using all the Microsoft tools. Oh yeah, and I was, I, I had already been computing for much too long before Microsoft came along. <laughs> uh, uh, that was, no, they didn't do anybody job. any any anybody any favors. No, I, I, I ugh, what a, what a, tragic mess we, that we we hacked up our source control management um essentially adding more features uh, enabling more features on the ide itself <laughs> on eclipse <laughs> <laughs> okay. share which files um and taking a look at the code repositories and making sure they're actually synced up and then of course you know pulling them off doing manual diffs <laughs> <laughs> but it was a mess. Oh, it, it was. was. I mean, it, it, yes. you had to train people on just using the tool as opposed to actually writing code. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. and that's true. Uh, the funny, I've, the funny thing is, we've gotten it standardized now to the point where it's become a ninja <laughs> attack vector because it's consistent <laughs> now. Uh, well, a lot of things have changed, right? I mean, people now regard just because you understand SCM, they go, oh, yeah, this guy's an engineer. I'm like, no, he knows how to use a freaking piece of software. <laughs> same, same thing with people You writing. know how to write YAML. Well, this is exactly the point, right? YAML, right? Unless yeah. you understand computer science and get the architecture, uh, the YAML file, reading it itself, you no, know, you're not a developer, dude. <laughs> take a look at a syntax but that's it <sighs> yeah at, at, at the risk of, of uh, diverting the, the discussion however yeah, like, uh, uh, but at least i want to bring us up as a potential future topic um i i have a sort of a a white whale of problem and, and that is ci for ci particularly the the, the configuration like uh Hmm. So, some pipelines are easier to 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 lint and, and verify, but in many cases, CI is the one that produces artifacts, and and you can't really just run them on demand because then you're 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 clovering your versions, and and you you're, you're losing some some of that consistency that 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 you have in, in, in the artifacts that you produce. Yeah. So um, and, and and yes, there's ways to work around that. Although it, it all feels rather ham-fisted to me. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and I'm on, on this quest for an elegant solution to that problem. 
you, you, Back up yeah. for a second and explain explain the problem better to me, because I, I think I understand what you're saying, but I want to make sure I understand. I, I, I it as Grey Goo, right? <laughs> it's yeah, Heisenberg. So, so, so you you have to you have your CI pipelines. You you say right. like uh, it, it it does it does the linting. It it, it does uh, some uh, integration tests, which which are perfectly fine. You, you can do it whenever you want. But then at the end, it produces an artifact that you publish somewhere. Yeah. So how do you test your pipelines when you're developing them without producing the artifact, but what, at the same time verifying that your artifact publishing step is working. You, you've got to have a separate system. You can't, you have to have a, a, a separate ecosystem to demonstrate it. It's the canary staging system kind of thing, where if, if you have it on the system itself, you're modifying the system. So you have a separate right. system for verification before you, you know, it's, in the old Unix, it's the minus N. Show me everything you're doing, but don't do it. Well, this kind of right. do everything yeah. you're doing on a separate, isolatable system. And when it, it is verified, then do it on the real system. Great. So how do I integrate that oh. now with GitHub releases and, uh, and <laughs> Docker Hub and, and, and every other repository where, where I'm publishing iPhone? Sure, I, I, can have, uh, I can have, say, test repositories that are private where I'm, where I'm publishing, but that still puts me a step away from 100% from coverage. Right. Because I cannot test the credentials uh -huh. to the actual repository, for example. Anyway, that's my white way. I, I guess I guess I'm. I mean, because I've I've seen I've seen and had conversations about the challenge of like the infrastructure side behind the pipelines and man and and because a lot of these pipelines are consuming and destroying infrastructure in a very opaque way. Um, you're, but that's not what you're asking. What you're mm -hmm. you're you're sounding like you want to verify that the code that goes into the pipeline is itself verified. Yeah, the configuration yeah. itself. And and I mean, kind kind of like how Ansible and with Ansible I can do a dry run. Um, um. With with CI, uh, yes, I, I I can do to some degree some some, some dry runs. Um, but even like even with Ansible, I, I can't get 100% coverage. Like I, there's some things that I just need to run them live to, to see if they're working. Yeah. And, and, it, and it feels getting... like we, we're just like a, a whole generation behind everything else. But like we, we're we're having these wonderful CI systems for that we're building for software development, for infrastructure management, so infra, like infrastructure as code even. Right. But we kind of neglected ourselves. Yep. The, 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 challenge, <laughs> the challenge that I see, because one of the things that, that, you know, I look at dry run as a feature set, and for what we do, it's, it's, it's proven really, really hard to do dry run because the, the, the cascade, the, the stages and the state cascades across the system. Yep. Um, Right, we we substituted that with making it easier to do dev test and stage, and then and then pull artifacts, stage like pick up artifacts and version them and move them as a unit and move them through test dev test stages. But the idea of dry running something um, is super hard. Locking it's not that hard, so that you would know, hey, I've actually pulled this stuff forward in a consistent way. Mm -hmm. um, so I still don't feel like it's the same thing as you're asking. Yeah, no, you, you need a, a separate target, but if you have a separate target, then you're not guaranteed to have a matching system as the one that you're actually running all the time. Right. Well, you're guaranteed to not have a matching system. Well, unless you're using immutable infrastructure, Rob. <laughs> I, but it, I mean, if you're using, so you're going to get a matching OS image, a, ba a matching base, but the, I mean, the systems themselves are constantly churning underneath you from that perspective. Right. 
Um, just, I mean, just. And they, I mean, they need to. It's not a. It's not a matter of of. Uh, and not. That, I mean, that to me is part of the part of this dilemma is that you're, you know, you're mutating the systems to go through the process. So you could you could freeze it and jump back to that point, I suppose. But I'm not sure that we're talking about the same problem. So I'm trying. Well, I'm just trying to yeah. understand it. And what Klaus is talking about, uh, they they had the same problem in OpenStack, but they weren't as cognizant of the fact that here they were wanting everything to to run from uh, trunk, and yet the software that they were using to build it uh, all was like mm. two three generations behind because they had to test it to see if it would work. Uh, like moving from Python 2 to Python 3 was such a pain in the butt because that was part of the infrastructure underlayment. And uh, they got the fact that, that their infrastructure for build couldn't move in CI, CD fashion, whereas all the rest of the infrastructure software that they were creating in OpenStack did move that way. And it's... Uh, I guess a different way to, I guess a different way to state the problem is, how do you unit test your CI pipelines? Do you need to? My husband is here nodding <laughs> in agreement. <laughs> um, yes, you do. Yes, you do need yeah. to. You yeah. have to, because otherwise you have. This, this is part of where the supply chain problem comes in. Oh, I see where you're going. Okay. It's, and it's not just the, the supply chain. It's one of these things where you're, you're doing CI. How do you make sure that the, the thing you're pulling out of the internet to, to rev your, the, the CI of your build system is actually going to function properly and doesn't break something somewhere along the line that uh, suddenly has your entire infrastructure, your entire build system down for however long it takes to back it out. Or, or even, even simpler, how do you guarantee uh, that you handle all the error conditions in, in, in your CI pipeline? <laughs> like, for example, uh, Simple error, uh, like something that, that I ran into a couple of months back. Uh, had a pipeline that pulls from Git. Uh, from, from I uh, actually it gets a webhook notification from from GitHub for a pull mm -hmm. request. Uh, pulls it, um, and it pulls it in, in a in a way that so that it it replicates the the merge uh, the merge of the pull request. Uh, so it pulls the base and merges in the branch, uh, and then does a whole bunch of tests. And then posts back to the um, uh, to uh, to GitHub saying like success and failure, which is which should be a pretty standard approach. But if there is a if the, if the if the uh, source branch cannot be merged into the target branch, it throws an error and mm -hmm. do, doesn't pull anything, and it doesn't and that means that it doesn't get. The, the necessary information to post the failure to the pull request. Um, now, I worked around it by, eventually by, by, by just saying like, okay, if it's this kind of failure, then just uh, just pull the, 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 the source branch and, and then you get the information like without merging. Um, but ultimately, this is something that um, that, I, that I couldn't have uh, unit tested uh, without actually running into this issue. Right. I, is that unit testing it? I mean, it's it sounds like there's there's gate validation checks that you that you want to do to make sure that at each stage you've advanced correctly and that you have the components. Uh, yes and no. I guess that's so, what a unit so you, that's, you I mean, that's, that's not different than a unit test. So from a unit test, what you're doing is you're saying, I reached this point, does this behave, or at this point, this should behave this way. 
please ver you know, verify and check. So what I implemented was gate validation test. Uh, test. What I want mm -hmm. is unit tests. So when I'm, when I'm developing the pipeline in the first place, I can run it and say, yes, it, it, it's, I, I've covered all of these gate validation checks that, that should have covered. Right, none of these exceptions happen. <laughs> yeah. But it's really hard to cover the exception of not merging without merging first mm -hmm. or attempting to merge. <laughs> yeah, I guess, why isn't that just better checks inside of the automation you're building? I mean, those kind of checks, you want them to be present in, inside the automation that you're building. Right. Um, but do you want to have to test these in your live pipeline? Or, or do you want to test them in a different pipeline, in a controlled environment, before you push oh. them live? So, so, you're, so you're actually describing a so when you make a change, a commit to your pipeline code, this would go through and exercise your pipeline code in a way, in a predicted way, so that you could verify that the change to your pipeline code was also accept. Is, is that what yes. you're? Is, yes. Is over? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and of course the the challenge is that is that because your pipeline is in many cases uh, the Mm, okay. producing stateful outputs, you can't just run them willy-nilly. Right, so you need a reference. The challenge is you need a reference, successful pipeline, run the pipeline, test the pipeline. Ugh. So, so the, the issue is the system under test is a system uh, that's being, yeah. that, that's... Uh, You're testing in production. Yeah. system under test is production. And yeah, we see all this stuff where everybody says test and production, but this isn't the same kind of test and production test. <laughs> Just because it can doesn't mean you shouldn't. <laughs> so it's, it's for, oh, I, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's for some things, I mean, like simple things like did it, could you create a dummy repo that kind of mirrors the uh, mm. what you use for your pipeline and do like operations like a merge that fails there? Like script that, something simple that isn't really building anything of consequence. That is effectively what I do right now. Uh, although, as, as I said before, it, it feels ham-fisted. It, 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 it works. It, it, it's just so in, inelegant, and it's, 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 it's a brute force uh, solution to, to the problem that I feel should have a, a, a nicer solution. Yeah, I mean, some of what you're describing to me is like standard modules. It's the, these aren't these aren't things that you should be writing custom at all. That you know that type of check should be a standard that you just drop a, into every pipeline you have. That's that's what I would have expected. Yeah, but this this whole you know dry run and Ansible maybe it, it there really needs to be a an equivalent in in Git. Yeah, but but dry run won't won't catch this. Uh, I mean, it, it'll help you inspect what's hap what's going on. Oh, and maybe it would you would dry run and then throw a throw a flag. But the only reason you're going to know this is a problem is if you have, for the merge example, is if you have unmergeable code, you have to unit test with an unmergeable change and then um, handle, you know, and then validate that it handled that case correctly. And the, the utility is real because you, you're trying to make sure that you don't merge bad code. And so you want to test that your, your protections there still work. Um, it it gets complicated a, a bit with, with what CI pipelines, uh, particularly when one of your steps in the pipeline 
produces an intermediate artifact that you carry forward to the next steps because yeah, that's right. because your build time takes an is an hour and, and you don't want to rebuild it five different times. Right. Mm. Anyway, yeah, uh, I'm, again, I, like, it, I, I, these I, are good I questions. I'm, You've got no, to. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to think about it. It, it relates to the stuff that we're we're doing all the time with building standard pipelines, and you know we do pipelines are just not CI pipelines, and they're deployment pipelines, but we have very similar mm -hmm. uh, challenges. And then whenever you touch anything, we just have this conversation where somebody somebody uh, we have a, a task that's been around forever that. Um, Usually we use Bash, and so it works great in Bash. But if you have another POSX shell, um, we've detected some anomalies. And so the idea was, hey, we're going to fix this and make it POSX compliant. And the risk, and, and likely we could do it, but there was no feasible way to test it across enough variants to know that we wouldn't break something by refactoring it. <laughs> um, and so it was like, if you want to fix it, fix it, but you got to call it something new. Don't, don't refactor this thing that's in production in thousands of places. Um, there, it was, even though, right, it, there was no, there was no reasonable way to test that you covered all the production scenarios. Um, all we could do is migrate to something better. We see that all the friggin' time. Um, it's not exactly the same problem, but it's the same. Like, like you just, there's so many scenarios that you can't test for much as you fix something new. Yeesh. For your pipeline, would you, t would you then go back and build previous versions to make sure that your CI commit is backwards compatible? Now you've got him thinking. Yeah, I'm sort of abstract. I mean, I. It's. We're... Well, I can see where you wouldn't test backwards compatibility because there would be other than to uh, for recovery because this is your infrastructure. You're moving forward, so. We have, we have this we have this problem all the time with uh, modules where we try to be backwards compatible from a mod uh, things you shouldn't have to be you shouldn't be forced to upgrade a module, but you can't back you know there's no expectation of back revving so like if you replace we're going through a major version right now and so if you replace a the server we want to have it so the old content keeps working. But if you bring in new content, your the expectation is it's not going to work against an old server. Um, so it's you know there's a there's there's a version synchronicity implication, um, but testing it's super hard. CI pipeline's a little bit the same, right? Every time you make a change to the CI pipeline, I don't know how far back you go to make sure it works yep. against old mm -hmm. stuff. Boss, you have an opinion? Uh, sorry, I, I missed part of it because I had answered a call, but I just caught, <laughs> uh, no I just, worries. I just caught the end of it. And uh, I, I'm assuming that you're talking about like uh, what you guys do uh, being similar to, uh, to the problem that I, that I posted. And, and yes, I agree with that. So that this, um, it, it feels similar in that, right, we do stuff that's very wor workflow pipeline-y and yeah. state flows through the pipeline and so it's really really hard when you get to stage six of the pipeline to you know either dry run it or um you know test it in a, in the in abstraction yeah and, and um, yeah. yeah i mean I, I, yeah I, I agree it's the same problem space like a, i mean okay. different application but but ultimately uh, yeah. What you have is a 
a process that mutates uh, uh, the state of something, um, and you want, and, and you need to mm -hmm. verify that without clobbering the the state that that uh, that you would eventually be modifying. Um, I mean, with, with CI, I kind of feel that this hasn't been brought uh, up often because the the people that do CI uh, a lot don't there's not that many there's not that many who have uh, builds with with high lead time particularly in, in the in the era of microservices where you, where you can do a build in under minutes sure. so 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 if your pipeline fails well just modify it and in five minutes you're done um, when your when your pipeline however has a lead time of hours um, because either you're doing extensive tests uh, during it or just because you, your your application is so big that it takes that long to compile in the first place, even on, on with a high number of cores, um, you feel it more. And yes, yeah, so I, I, I kind of feel that also in, 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 in your problem, in problem space, you would kind of feel it more as well because there's still, it doesn't take seconds to, to bring up uh, a new VM. It, take, <laughs> it still it takes take, a minute or two. It takes, it can, it can, if we were going to go through a full test, it's going to take a significant amount of time, right? If you're going to deploy yeah. a CentOS and then run, you know, that we've been talking about doing exactly that. So every build, spin up an environment, you know, bootstrap, go through bootstrap, install OSs, go through that. But the value for doing that's high. Um, the, the thing that we're worried about is that um, it wouldn't actually catch that much of a, of a dependency, of, or it wouldn't actually catch that much that yeah. would impact customers. But um, wouldn't it be all it needs to do is catch one? Uh, it's it would a risk reward thing. So if if catching one isn't that big a deal, then you know why bother? But if catching one is the a, a big difference or a big risk, then you do it anyway. The the thing that has always had us worried is that it's going to catch, and maybe this and and this is a there's a reward. It's going to catch the. Um, repos moving out from under us, right? Well, a lot of the times we get broken by dependencies shifting around, right? Doing, you know, uh, Red Hat or Ubuntu breaking, you know, taking down ISOs. Uh -huh. Seems to happen all the friggin' time. Um, the, the challenge that we have with that is that has nothing to do with our commit. So it's going to happen. And this is why we didn't get, we don't get that worked up on, on, on making this part of the automated system, it ends up having to be a nightly build, not a commit build from that perspective. So for us to test the dependency breaks, you end up with a nightly or an hourly build regardless. And so it's like, all right, just run the build, whether, whether we've changed anything or not, because stuff that we're doing um, has, a, has a dependency graph half-life. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, it got so bad, we stopped relying on public mirrors and we now point people to our own mirrors of of those isos which drives which i hate um because i don't want to be a public mirror um but i mean this these, these build problems are very real They're really significant mm -hmm. and ci just makes it worse <laughs> That's the issue. See, I make the well, work though. So how do you how do you ensure against the issues of somebody else's CI uh, pushing something new that breaks your stuff? <laughs> well, I think CI, CI's made it right possible for us to make even more complex interdependencies, <laughs> right? That's what we've seen. And and then they're completely invisible um, from that perspective. Well, just wait until you get 
AI in there, then you'll have complete opacity. Oh, Lord. Yeah. But there was, I mean, there's a part of me that would love to see at the end of, right, this is close. This is where I go with some of what you're saying. I would love to see some type of cleanup sweep after every one of these, after every stage, CI for, or stages for us, where you could actually come in and train it and say, at the end of this, I expect the environment to look like this. And I expect the state information I have that's available to look like this and snapshot that and then be like, oh, all right, this is this, you know, at, that would be a gate at the, and that you could add everywhere. And it would sort of give you some sense of security that you've moved, you know, at, at the end of every gate, you've reached a, a reasonable point. Like we have, and Senator, we have a whole bunch of checks that we do before anything starts and before a assist a command is run. We don't have as many exit state pieces. Hmm. So there'd be more kind of oh, go ahead. Yeah, there'd be more like classical symbolic AI that you're checking. Okay, you need X Y Z for the next stage. Do we have? or X, Y, Z in the future at some point, is that output, are we outputting things that we don't need kind of symbolic checks? You're not talking about like training a neural net kind of thing. It, it, the, this is a, and we've had this as a debate on the team. Like we have inputs that have required, you have required parameters as inputs, optional parameters as inputs. It's a really, it's really nice. So you're like, okay, these are things I know I, I know I need. These are things I know I can set. What we've, what we've, argued about is if you should also have um, an output list. So the if... problem with the output list is back in my QA days, one of the early uh, parts of the development of QA slash test, uh, we would have golden files. And the golden files is hmm. this is what a good run is. <laughs> and the problem is, is the system that you were testing against changed often enough that you were always fixing your golden files. And so the output, um, especially in a system mm -hmm. that like what Klaus is talking about and what you're talking about, uh, the, the checks would fail, but they wouldn't, you, the checks would fail, but it wouldn't be a real failure. And so you'd have to go and say, okay, this is okay too. And you are, and this is the problem with the old traditional style of, of testing is that you were spending more time fixing the test than writing new decent yeah. tests. Well, you know, that's, that's a challenge. It's, it's, a, I'm, I'm, yeah, some of this is docs, which also age just as fast as your, your validation files. Yep. Um, I mean, we do actually, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it, but we have a task has a limited scope of control. And so if it's going to make changes outside of its scope, yeah, uh, you do have to open up those permission files for it to make those changes, um, against our system, but not against other systems. So hmm. interesting to think about. Cool. All right. We're at the top of the hour. So everybody thank you um i'm gonna do a little bit more prep for next week and see if i can get us to have a very concrete topic and then advertise it in advance and do do my homework i still feel off this week so sure hey rob uh on the, yeah. chat, on the chat before, yeah. before it vanishes i just posted a url <clears throat> in particular what you were talking about the it's, it's known the as the graph attack itself so take a look at it's a very fantastic solution that these guys came up with um take a look at that um let me know what you think that's cool yeah yeah um, oh, and then they actually have and they have a solution for the homograph exactly uh with close to well it's over greater than 95 96 percent accuracy um yet to be patented but you know uh, anybody else can just as easily build it on sagegraph 
the catch is oh, now um, the folks that are actually controlling the DNS infrastructure, right? Are they going to start using uh, it, right? I mean, I, it would be nice if uh, Cloudflare could just pick this up. They're responsible for uh, what way <laughs> close over, greater than 80% of DNS uh, traffic. So if they could start using it, all other major DNS providers, if they could start using it, uh, then this is this is a solved problem, right? Because, and the approach they've taken is how people get duped into this is visually the characters look the same. So they've just used, they're using a CNN classifier that does exactly this, that does a visual assessment of what the character looks like, compares it oh, with you know, good, bad domain names. <laughs> Just says, yeah. yeah, they're actually using Amazon. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could use any other. Uh, I'm sure GCP <laughs> has Tesla clusters. They could use GCP. They could use Azure. It's it's a CNN classifier, though. In this case, they're using SageMaker on AWS. But right, no, it makes perfect. It's sense. it's it is a solved problem. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. All right, guys. Thank you Bye, for guys. sharing that. Yeah. No worries. See you next week. Bye. Thanks for joining us for another DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, if these are happy and enjoyable to you, uh, we sure hit some interesting topics for me, and I enjoy the conversations. Just come up, come on by. We do this every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Central, 11 a.m. Pacific. We want to hear from you. Thanks.